Oh. 
to come and uh, assist us as we bring our offerings to the Lord this morning.
Then I lost my job at a calendar factory because I took a month off. <laughs> <laughs> And then I lost my job as a human cannonball. I got fired. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, lost my job as a math teacher. That was in in 2020. You know, about 39 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> and. Uh, I lost my job in Stalin Mother. That job was me too exhausting. Who told them I'm any grown? And then I tied my hand at a garbage collector. There wasn't any training. They just figured I'd pick it up as I go. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, I lost my job at the upholstery factory, and I may never recover. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, all seriousness aside, you know the Bible says that we all have a purpose. Even I'm dating over there. They ain't got some new friends with me. <laughs> So anyway, um, <laughs> the Bible says that we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good work that God prepared for us to do. And that means that every one of us has a purpose and God created us with that purpose. So, I don't care how old you are, or how young you are, or how whatever you are, God can use you, and he's got a plan for you. Right? Amen. Okay, well, that was the good news for today, and I'm going to head on out of here and see what's up next. Bye! Bye! <laughs> Sometimes it's moments of brokenness which create the greatest transformations. Times where fear gives birth to faith, pain leads to healing, and chaos dissolves into peace. It's in these times we often see God more clearly. For in our deepest turmoil, He remains faithful. When our spirit is crushed, he remains strong. When our moment is too heavy, he carries the burden. As gold is refined by fire, we too are often refined by struggle. It's part of growing, changing, becoming. Lately, the journey has been difficult. Our breath has been labored. Our steps uneasy. But we stand in faith, knowing who is leading us through this desert. The God of peace, the God of hope, the God of restoration. The awesome news is that wherever you are this morning in your life. He is the God that brings restoration. Amen. And he knows you better than you know yourself. He knows who you are. He knows you by name. And you are his. Aren't you glad for that this morning? Amen. I wonder what key I'm supposed to be in. Thank you. I wrote it down. I'm so smart.
<laughs> sing right through the chorus and sing it again. <clears throat> I have a name deep on my heart before even time began. My life was in his hand. He knows my name. He knows my every thought. He sees each tear that falls and hears me when I He calls me his own. He'll never leave me, no matter where I go. He knows my name. He knows my every thought. He sees each tear. And hears me when I call. He knows your name. He knows your every thought. He sees your tears that fall and hears you when you call. He hears us when we Thank you that we can call you Father. You know our hearts and our minds this morning. You know our every circumstance. Father, you are fully aware of the burdens that we carry today with us. You know the things that hurt. Sometimes we're reluctant to to be so transparent with other people that we would talk to them about such things, but you already know, and you're already at work. You are our awesome God. And Father, I uh, pray today for our nation. Yes, Lord. I pray that uh, once again, oh God, you would, Restore uh, in the power of your spirit, guide the minds our American citizens, that we would see your truth, oh God, and we would see what you have for us, how, how following your ways and your word would give us good and merciful days ahead. Father, I pray for circumstances in Haiti today and in Israel and in Ukraine. Father, I, I lift each of these to you. I pray especially for innocent victims, folks just caught in the middle and are suffering. And I pray, Father, for those who are fighting for what is right. And then I pray God, your strong arm of justice against those who are fighting for things that are evil, things that are anti-God, anti-Christ. And Lord, we thank you for the privilege to be the church today and your call upon us to reach our community surrounding this campus and the communities where we live. And we desire to take Jesus uh, to our families and to our neighbors. And I pray that in the power, again, of your Holy Spirit, we would be your witnesses. 
in our local area and to the ends of the earth. And Lord, as we open the word today, I pray that you would teach us and that your spirit would bind our hearts to you. And I pray this in Jesus' name. So I want to show you a list, and you tell me what the names on this list have in common. Actually, David's going to show you the list. Uh, Babe Ruth, Leo, Toy Story, where you, you can read them. Um, any ideas, anybody, just off the top of your head? Millionaires. Millionaires. No. Candy bar. They're all famous. <laughs> They're all famous. That's good. Anybody else? They were leaders, okay? And several of them pioneers, huh? Pardon me? And David clicks on that slide and it says adopted. Carrie, wow. you are right. <laughs> How did you do that? About half of them adopted by an extended family member after their parents died. Uh, the others um, adopted because they were either put up for adoption or they were abandoned. Hmm. Tremendous, isn't it? Well, we are uh, in this little series. I titled it Written in Stone. That there are some things on which we can count all the time. Every day, every year, every decade, every century, male, female, young, old. There are some things that we can count on. And in order to have a society that is sustained, we need those absolute truths. And we are living in a society where absolute truth has kind of uh, been put on the back burner for a lot of people. And the basic idea of many in our society is, if I think it's true, then it's true. If I think I'm a female, then I'm a female. Hmm. And so truth is fluid in our society. And society cannot last forever if there are no absolute truths. And so... Um, we began last, last week talking about some things that God has written in stone, and one of those is marriage. That marriage is between one man and one woman, and that it is for a lifetime. And so we unfolded all of that and talked about how God's grace is, is available and sufficient for those who, who have fallen short, which would be most of us falling short of God's ideal, uh, but it's still true. Marriage uh, is still God's idea. It's still holy, and it still brings a man and a woman together and makes them one. We have two newlywed couples here today. Connor, are you still a newlywed? I don't know. Yes. Does it feel like you're a newlywed? Okay. <laughs> Kara saying, uh uh. <laughs> uh. Glad you guys are here with us, and, and Derek and Whitney. Y'all are newlier weds than they are. July and October? September. Uh, September, okay. Um, so, you know what? I'm going to have you guys, if you don't mind, come to the front for just a minute. I want to say a prayer over y'all. <clears throat> Give him a warm welcome, would you? Woo Connor and Kara, Brittany and Derek, and uh, this church loves you guys. Um, 
Well, we love your parents. <laughs> so we have to love y'all too. No. We know you and love you because you have been a part of this church and your parents have been a part of this church for 40 years. And um, so we wanted to take the opportunity to congratulate you all and uh, do something formal for you. So we have planted a tree for each of you and things have grown on it. <laughs> um, I don't know what's in all those envelopes, but it looks good. And so at the end of the service, uh, you're welcome to take your tree and take it home. I started to say the tree, the whole tree, and nothing but the tree, which will mean the cards stay here, so I can't say that. Uh, and if you don't want the tree, you just want what's on the tree, that's fine too. Uh, if you just want the cash, that's fine too. But uh, just a way for us to say that we love you guys, we believe in you, and uh, we support you, and uh, I want to pray God's blessing on you. Father, I thank you for these two precious couples. I thank you for uh, two homes that were created because they decided to come together in a holy union. And God, I pray that in the days to come, in the weeks, and the months, and the years, uh, that they would find their rest in you and that they would grow together, their love would, would continue to mature, uh, that their home would be blessed by you. And uh, we know it's not always going to be an easy road, but we do know that in Christ there is peace and there is love. And Lord, thank you for the gift of children. Thank you for this precious little one today who uh, steals our hearts every time we see her. Uh, I pray, God, for uh, the parents and grandparents. Uh, give them wisdom to know when to step in, when to stand back, uh, and, and to be ever supported. I know they will be. And I thank you most of all for your gift of love. I bless these couples in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Yeah. God bless you guys. Thank you very much. And so we talked about marriage, and, and today um, we're going to look at something else that God has written in stone. Went to a, the funeral of Dr. Fred Huff this past week. Uh, many of you know Dr. Huff, uh, knew Dr. Huff, and, and his wife Dinah. In fact, when when Fred was, I think he was a youth pastor in Nashville, he brought a group of teens to Douglasville, Georgia, and, and they did a BBS for us. Uh, that was years and years and years ago. Um, and, and Fred, uh, I like to say that he lived life larger than life because he was a really big guy. Always has been, as long as I, not always, but as long as I've known him. I, I saw a picture of him uh, on Facebook. He was in a, the encounters at Trevecca. I almost didn't recognize him. He was, he wasn't thin, but he wasn't huge. <laughs> uh, but anyway, Fred loved life. Fred was the, the perfect example of the fact that you can be a Christian and be happy and, and enjoy life all at the same time. Uh, he was a cut up. Uh, he was unique. And the, the scripture, uh, two different individuals used the scripture uh, for Fred. John chapter 10, verse 10. When Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. And Fred is just a picture of abundant life. Um, by the way, it's important. The first part of that verse is important for us today. It says, the thief comes to steal and to kill. But I have come that you might have life and have it to the full. 
God wants to give you a life of fulfillment and joy. You know, he doesn't tell us how to live in order to keep us away from those things. He actually draws us to that kind of a life. I heard, uh, it was a, I think it was a comedian, and so he, I, I guess he was trying to be funny, but it, I thought it was very sad, especially if it, it's the truth about his life. He said, why is being alive so expensive? I'm not even having a good time. Well, if you're not having a good time, it's a great question, right? Why is life so expensive? But we ought to be having a good time. I don't mean that we should live life and have no difficulties and burdens. But we should live life to the full. God is pro-life. He is for life. And that's why he said, I've come to give you this abundant life. Death is the result of sin. Life is the gift from God. And so even at a Christian funeral, we celebrate. We celebrate the person's life. And we know that his or her life continues in the presence of Jesus. And in reality, the grieving and the mourning that we all go through at the loss of a loved one, it's for us. <laughs> if our loved one is a believer, we're not grieving and mourning for them. They're, they're now living the best life they could ever have. And so the sorrow is for us because we missed it. They left a hole in our life. But God is pro-life. He is for life. And if he is all about being a life giver, then you and I also must be pro-life. And to say that, it, it means a lot more than the fact that we do not support abortion or any of the laws that provide for abortion. It, it's, it's broader than that. Abortion is only one category under the umbrella of euthanasia. Euthanasia is uh, the practice of intentionally ending life to eliminate pain and suffering. And so, women who uh, are experiencing an unwanted pregnancy want to end their own personal pain and suffering, and so they get rid of the problem. They get rid of the cause. But it isn't just about unwanted pregnancies. It's a mercy kill. Doctors perform them on patients who are terminally ill at the request of the patient. And the list goes on. But it, what, what it does is, see, it, it assumes that we know better than God what's best for this person or what's best for ourselves. And abortion assumedly saves the mother from pain and suffering, but little thought is given to the suffering of an unborn fetus and the suffering that it experiences in the womb. Again, abortion is, is not the only part of euthanasia. There's more to it. And, and as we move through it today, uh, I will, you will probably hear more references to abortion, but please understand that the principles apply all across the board. Euthanasia. The physician assisted suicide of terminally ill patients. Uh, the abortion uh, because of unwanted pregnancies. People who are just tired of life and they want out. The law does not tell us at what point a sick or disabled person should be expected to bow out of his or her earthly existence. 
And it should. The law should not determine that. And there's no objective code providing guidance for doctors who want to know whether and when they should terminate a pregnancy or administer a lethal injection to a suffering patient. And in fact, to the contrary, the Hippocratic Oath always requires physicians to do no harm under any circumstance. Yet, here we are, living in a society where doctors ignore that Hippocratic Oath. Truthfully, the right of, to life theology should also protect the mentally and physically handicapped, the aging, the desolate. And our Western society tends to write off because of age-related inabilities, people who have gotten to the place where they are, according to our society, no longer useful. The Western world does that. The Eastern world does not. And because the mind and body, or body, is, is well beyond prime, they often are deemed to have nothing to contribute to society. You know, I'm going to, I hesitate whether to even say this, but uh, I have the opportunity, uh, because of my role in this church, to walk the halls of nursing homes in the community. It is heartbreaking to walk down the halls and just see person after person, many of them in wheelchairs, just in the hallway, usually head slumped, alone. Some of them get active, they'll go to the, to the rec room and, and play games or work on a puzzle or something. You know, some of them don't even go to the cafeteria. They just, they're so accustomed to being alone that they've grown to prefer that. Now, having said that, please do not ever feel guilty that you have put a parent or a grandparent in a nursing home. Sometimes, in fact, sometimes that's the very best that can be done for your loved one. So don't, don't feel guilty over and know that you're doing the very best you can. But I have to wonder as I walk through those halls, how many of those people have loved ones who are gonna come visit today, or at least a couple times a week. And then we've got some shut-ins, uh, two uh, that just immediately come to my mind, who live alone. And they don't leave their home. And so every day, 24-7, they are by themselves in their house. You know what? God still has a purpose for them. Amen. Both of those ladies have a, have a wonderful prayer ministry. They pray for you. Yes. They pray for me. And in fact, Miss Francis always assures us, I pray for you twice a day. Isn't that awesome? Well, I want to talk about this issue of life because it's very important in the processes of our society right now. As, as clear as day, there are two presidential candidates, one on one side of the issue, one on the other. We also have state and local candidates who are clearly on one side or the other. And so I want to talk about why pro-life is the only biblical position 
for a person to pray, for a Christian to take. Uh, and, and I'm going to read a, a little from a little a blog from a pastor. He wrote this. The topic of abortion is very personal to me. Not just because I'm a pastor, but because I myself was not planned. I was conceived as a result of a one-night stand and could have become another abortion statistic. Thankfully, that did not happen. My childhood was not easy. I was a reluctant passenger on my mother's wild roller coaster ride of marriage and divorce with seven husbands. She would drink to excess every night and pass out. But she did marry one good guy, and he says his name. He didn't drink, smoke, or party. And to tell you the truth, I don't know what she saw in him. Uh, the family crest is the image of a tree stump with growth coming out of it. The family motto uh, means it, it's a think a Latin word, and it means it buds afresh. And that describes my life. Its potential was cut down. I was likely to amount to nothing and end up like a no the notorious sinners in my family, but by the grace of God, he changed me, and a new life budded afresh. Why is pro-life the only biblical stance for a Christian. First of all, God planned our lives before we were born, before our birth. Your life, my life, planned by God. Would you read this with me? For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you. When I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. And Paul wrote to the Ephesians in chapter 2, verse 10, you are God's workmanship and he has a purpose for you that he planned before you were even born God knows you he knows you by name personally I can look back on every moment of my life and, and, and I can see where God's hand was on me and it still is in Jeremiah chapter 1, the Lord said to him, I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb. Before you were born, I set you apart and appointed you as my prophet to the nations. You notice that, that he doesn't say, I formed you in your mother's womb. Uh, he says that, but he doesn't say, and then I waited until you were born to have a plan for you because you were not really a human. You were just a mass of tissue. He didn't say that. Every life is planned and created by God. And all children deserve a chance at life. And again, I'm including not just the unplanned pregnancies, but the mentally and physically handicapped. God has a plan for every single baby that is conceived, regardless of the circumstances of that conception. Regardless. There is no such thing as an illegitimate child. Maybe there are illegitimate parents. <laughs> but the child God planned. And Paul's words to the Galatians, even before I was born, 
God chose me, he called me by his marvelous grace. Since the passing of Roe v. Wade in, in the early 1970s, an estimated 63 million babies have been born. 63 million. And that, that may be, even be an old stat. The abortion industry creates revenue in excess of $4 billion in the United States alone. And even though Roe v. Wade was overturned, a couple of years ago, many states have continued to practice under the banner of women's rights practice abortion. The truth is that abortion takes the life of an innocent child. I've seen videos of ultrasounds I've seen babies at 13 or 14 weeks. I, I, I've seen evidence as they kick or punch mama's belly. Mama feels that little life moving around. And, and so it's life. And it's murder when we abort a child, a fetus. And one of the reasons, I think, is that we have become desensitized to death. You know? We see it on video games. We see it in the movies. John Wayne, you know, he lived forever, didn't he? And we read it in the newspapers, and we hear it on the news every night that somebody has been killed, and, and it almost doesn't bother us anymore. We've heard it so much. We expect to hear it. The Hebrew word for murder literally means to dash in pieces. It's the intentional and forcible taking of another person's life. And through abortion, millions of children are being chemically burned, cut into pieces, suction, starved, crushed, poisoned, and impaled in the womb. And I'm sorry to have to give us that kind of a picture, but it's reality. It is reality. And so our culture dehumanizes these babies with terms such as terminating a pregnancy. They label them not as unborn babies, but as fetuses, embryos, globs of cells, <coughs> products of conception. The reality is that they are innocent children made in the image of God. And they have every right to live. Amen. In the Church of the Nazarene, uh, we have an official stance on abortion. And, and currently our stance is that um, we are totally against it unless, number one, the mother's life is in danger, or number two, uh, rape or incest. But I'm not sure it matters to God how the pregnancy came about. It's still a lie. It's still a lie. And there are repercussions about getting an abortion that most people don't talk about. In fact, they're covered over. But I know that it has lasting effects, lifetime lasting effects. Uh, first of all, there, there are biological or, or physical effects, health effects. 
often it affects whether or not a woman can have a baby later in life. There are psychological effects. I was reading the blog of one physician, <clears throat> excuse me, who uh, at one time in his practice did abort babies. And he said, one thing I know is that most, if not all, of the girls or women who abort their baby spend much of their life thinking, oh, she would have been nine years old today. Or she would have been, he would have been four years old. They mentally track the age that their child would be as they watch other children grow. And a lot of times, the, what they've done doesn't really fully sink in until later. So, I, I, I want to, first of all, did you get it? I'm pro-life. And I believe, according to God's word, that every Christian should be pro-life. And so, uh, knowing that we have a wide audience, congregation, uh, I want to answer three questions this morning. I want to address these. Uh, the first is this. Will God forgive those who had an abortion? What if you've had an abortion or helped someone else get one? Is there forgiveness for that? Well, I think there is. You remember John chapter 8 when Jesus found a woman caught in adultery? And the Pharisees said to him, the law says to stone her. What do you say? And so Jesus bent over and wrote in the ground, and then he stood up. And he said, he of you who is without sin, let him throw the first stone at her. And then he wrote on the ground a second time. Not sure what he wrote. But then it was the woman and Jesus alone. And John... 8.10 reads, When Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? Then Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. You know, it really doesn't matter what sin you've committed. God forgives you. If you had an abortion, or if you encourage others to get one, if you worked in an abortion clinic, ask God's forgiveness. Romans 8.1 now there is therefore no condemnation. None. For those who belong to Jesus. And I promise you that Jesus went to the cross for those unborn babies. And Jesus went to the cross for women who would choose to have an abortion. And he went to the cross for the physicians who would choose to offer that kind of service. Yes, I believe he forgives every person who comes to him in repentance and says, I'm sorry. Didn't know what I was doing. 
A second question. Do aborted babies go to heaven? <laughs> the Church of the Nazarene, uh, well, I shouldn't have, I'm going to say that part. I believe, in, and the Church of the Nazarene calls it, in fact, John Wesley calls it, provenient grace. That's a big, fancy theological word that means God has his hand upon those who are too young to make a decision for themselves whether or not to follow Christ. And that certainly includes babies in the womb who never make it out. Absolutely. I believe aborted babies go to heaven. And does abortion end with a procedure? I think I've already answered that. There, there are a lot of ramifications. Um, and before we go any further, I, I want us to see a video this morning. Let me set it up for you. Um, the woman's name is Abby Johnson. Anybody heard of her? Okay. Um, th there is a, a movie that's an excellent movie called Unplanned. Uh, and I encourage you to, to watch that. It's a story of uh, her life and why she left Planned Parenthood. She had worked her way up to clinical director before she left Planned Parenthood. And this is just, a, I think, maybe a four-minute clip of her giving an abbreviated testimony of her story. Being pro-life means that you are laser focused on ending abortion, that we are doing everything that we possibly can to end the destruction of innocent life in the womb. What caused me to really change my mind on the abortion industry and, and on abortion in general was actually witnessing a live ultrasound guided abortion procedure. Ultrasounds are not typically used in an abortion procedure. Abortions are usually done in a, a blind manner. So they have the abortion in instruments and they just blindly probe around in the woman's uterus until they have enough blood and tissue in a glass jar. Um, but I was, I was called in to assist with a visiting physician that day and he thought it would be a good learning experience for me to be able to see what actually happens in the in the uterus during an abortion. And I was called in, the baby was 13 weeks along. By 13 weeks, everything is completely formed on, on a preborn child. And I watched in shock and horror as um, this innocent child recoiled and fought and struggled for his life against the abortion instruments. And I knew then that there was life in the womb, that there was humanity in the womb. And I knew that if those two things were true, then I was on the wrong side of this debate. And I knew that what I had seen on that screen that day, it was not, it was not choice of any kind, you know, that that baby did not have choice. It was not reproductive justice. It wasn't justice of any kind. No justice for that, for that child. It wasn't health care. I knew that what I had witnessed on that screen was the intentional taking of an innocent human life. And we have a word for that, and it's murder. And I knew that I had just witnessed and had been a part of a murder. And not just that time, but I had had an abortion with two of my children. And I had participated in over 22,000 abortions working at Planned Parenthood. And so coming to grips with that, having to recognize 
that I had murdered two of my children, having to face my own sin, the burden of that, um, it's possible. It can be done. And, but I, I knew I could only really heal. I knew that I could only really face it with the help and forgiveness of Christ. Amen. In another video, when she talked about the image she saw on the screen, she said that the little baby, 13 weeks old, little baby's arms and legs were flailing, trying to get away from the instrument. And she said, the only, the only word that comes to my mind is frantic. The baby was frantically trying to get away from the instrument. In Proverbs 31.8, we are told to speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. Ensure justice for those being crushed. So what can we do? First of all, we need to determine to be pro-life in as many ways as we possibly can. Uh, first of all, vote for pro-life candidates, since that's just right around the corner we've got to mention that. Vote for pro-life laws. Be a voice in your community. We support PRC Medical, and I've put some statistics in the bulletin for you this morning of the great work they are doing. Pray for women who are facing the choice. Pray for pre-born babies. Pray for political policy makers. Pray that we will not lose our sensitivity to the act of mercy killing. God has written in stone that marriage is between one man and one woman and that they are one. And God has written in stone that he is a life giver. And no one else has the right or the authority to choose life or death for another person. It is in God's hands. And he knows your days before you were even born. He knows what he has planned your life to look like. He's written it in stone. And I don't care how many laws of the land are written. God's word cannot be changed. It cannot be overcome. Heavenly Father, we love you and we thank you for the gift of life. For many of us, the idea of abortion is it's foreign to us. We've not had experience with it. We've not had someone close who has gone through it. And, and Lord, thank you for that. And then we know that there are some maybe online with us today or in this room who have been very close to it. And whatever the case, Lord, this morning, we know your grace is sufficient. I pray forgiveness for those who need it this morning in relation to life. Life giving, life taking. I pray, Lord, not only for their forgiveness, but that you would remove their feelings of guilt and know that you love them. Thank you for life and life everlasting and life abundant. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We've still got a couple uh, little quick things here. Um, we want to sing this, this little.
for us. And then another about a three minute video that'll close us out. But thank you guys so much for being here. Appreciate it. He is like unto this soul of mine, my Jesus, my Jesus. He is like unto this soul of mine, Jesus Christ, my Lord, divine. It's a great little song. I, I trust you'll go find that and uh, let the Lord speak to your heart through it. All right? Thank you guys for joining us. And uh, you folks, let's open our minds and our hearts as we uh, hear this great message.